There's a battle going on in Muslim communities in Britain and across the Islamic world. A hidden struggle between religious fundamentalists and a group of people who are heading in the opposite direction. They are ex-Muslims, people who are leaving Islam entirely. They are forced to live in the shadows. They locked me in the house and they hit me. I don't think it would be that hard for them to kill me. I have four head stabs, um, like machete ones on my head. You are going to get shunned. You are going to get mistreated. I found an underground resistance movement who defy fundamentalists here and across the Islamic world. Internet and social media is our battleground. Our numbers are growing each and every day. Just because we're silent doesn't mean we don't exist. Nastik Murtadarke, Fasir Manshe, Julia Charboy Charbo, Inshallah. The hellfire is waiting for anyone who is rejecting Allah and his messenger. Moreover, their families, they should not continue having any kind of relationship with them. This is a time bomb of young people who are being traumatized, really. I've spent a year filming with a woman who's known as the most controversial and outspoken ex-Muslim in Britain. They see us as people who are troublemakers, deviant, apostates and blasphemers. She gets regular death threats and she's often criticized for her attitude towards religion. There is nothing, nothing more intolerant than religion. But I spent time with her behind the scenes. I'm shaking. When she isn't campaigning, she spends her life helping ex-Muslims who are in deep trouble, even danger. Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain is both a campaigning group for the right to apostasy, and it's also a support group, really, for people who've left Islam. Maryam was born in Iran. As a teenager, she escaped with her family after her country was taken over by a fundamentalist Islamic government. She established her organization 10 years ago. It's just a movement that is run by and organized by volunteers, many of them people that we might have helped, and they come back to help others. Maryam introduced me to Sadia. She's one of the young people their group has helped in the last year. Sadia grew up in Oxford and lost her faith aged 15. She says she was immediately told to stay quiet. I remember saying to my mum that I don't think I believe in God anymore. And her saying, you can't tell anybody else because um, they'll kill you. Like, we're obliged to kill ex-Muslims. Um, it would put me at extreme risk if um, anybody else was to find out. So that conversation ended there. <laughs> But Sadia told me she wanted to appear in this film because she wants to honor the memory of her brother, Raza. That's my favorite picture of him. He always had the same smile, always had this kind of cheeky, like uncomfortable smile. He was just so cute, so, so cute. Raza was doing a chemistry degree at the University of Hull. She says it was his love of science which led him to lose his faith. One thing everybody knew about him was that he was an atheist. He was much, much more open than I was about it. Last year, Raza killed himself, aged 28. I just miss my friend. Because he was my best friend. I've been through a lot in life. Um, I'd happily go through everything again if I could have him. Before he died, Raza spoke of having hated himself since his mid-teens. Sadia says there were a number of reasons why he felt this way. 
but she believes it was partly because he'd come out as an atheist when he was around 14. I feel like when you uh, leave Islam, your intelligence gets attacked. Um, they kind of make you feel like you're stupid for making such a decision, um, which he felt like his entire life. Leaving Islam, uh, becoming an ex, becoming an ex-Muslim, all of a sudden you feel like you're dirty. You become uh, unimportant within the community. It's just, it's really strange. Raza sank into depression and drug dependency. He started hating himself so much because he never really experienced real love and compassion. And ultimately, you just kind of go back to that horrible, empty feeling where you realise that... It's so sad, isn't it, that actually nobody really loves you and that you are really lonely. burden that you carry of disappointing everyone around you is what kills people, is what kills ex-Muslims. It's this burden of the guilt that you are disappointing your family and loved ones. That's what kills you. <laughs> In the work that we do, we find it very common for young people, especially, to feel shunned and ostracized and shamed. A lot of people are torn between living their lives and gaining the approval of their parents and their family. It is devastating for a lot of the young people who go through it. Samira lost her faith 10 years ago but only told her parents recently. I'll never forget how my mum just cried for ages. My dad couldn't talk much. And my mum was wailing, she was begging me not to do this. And what did you say? Dad, I have to, and I'm sorry. I have to tell you who I am. For the last 10 years I've been this, I'm only disclosing it to you now. And you've loved me the whole last 10 years, I'm just the same person. And they're like, but no, you're, you know, you're a Catholic. The worst of the worst, because, you know, you're not even a Christian. You're not even a Jew. You're not even a Hindu. You have no God. To have no God, you're the worst kind. All of a sudden here, I was perceived as someone that had no morals. I was a loose woman with no morals. My mum and dad are so heartbroken, and it hurts me, but I had to tell them that I had to break their heart. You feel a lot of guilt about yeah. this? Yes, I do. It's having living parents, living family, such strong attachments, and you mourn their loss all their life. Samira is still in contact with her parents, but the relationship is very difficult. Her identity is disguised to protect them because of the pressure they might face from the wider community. Well, I think the community will come to my parents and tell them that their daughter has dishonored them, and that she has dishonored the community that my parents didn't do a good job at all to bring up a daughter like me. They should have probably killed me when I was young. I wrote to a number of Muslim organizations in Britain to ask them about the treatment these young ex-Muslims faced. Only one religious figure agreed to meet me. Dr. Umar al-Hamdoun has held a number of senior positions in mainstream Islamic organizations. He says no one is compelled to be a Muslim. People can leave of their own free will and shouldn't be punished. But he accepts that shunning does happen. The Muslim community is a community uh, that is uh, based on religion. So if a person chooses to stop being a Muslim, they can't really expect that the Muslim community is still going to say to them, you're part of our community because, because you've left Islam, you've left the religion, the family do need to try and resolve their issues by sitting together, talking about 
uh, matters. But I do understand that, you know, if a family holds religion very deep to their heart, that when they see one of their members has left that religion, they feel a sense of betrayal. And obviously, a lot of people will just say, look, I can't deal with this, so I just shun that member out because he's betrayed me. Islam does put a big emphasis on faith. And sometimes somebody might have to reject uh, something or a certain person because their attitude towards uh, faith. That, that can happen. Would you do that? I, have children? Yes, I have children, yes. Would, would you reject your child? I wouldn't reject my uh, child. I pro I, my, my, my approach would be to sit with them and discuss with them. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shun them off, but I suppose, I suppose they would expect that things aren't the same. If a child goes against your, say, general plan, expectation, if they go against you, you might feel, uh, you know, that, okay, you, you're still my son, daughter, but, you know, I wasn't expecting that of you. Some people Maryam has helped have experienced serious violence and abuse. Safia contacted her three years ago. She says she just told her parents she didn't believe in Islam. Um, I was planning to run away from home and go to university because my parents didn't want me to move out of home. I think I said, I'm not a Muslim anymore. I thought that would mean that they would let me go. Um, but they locked me in the house. And they hit me. They burnt my arms. They burnt your arms? Yeah. I still have the scars. Like my dad, he said that he wished he, he'd already killed me or that he'd strangled me when I was born. Miriam put Safia in contact with the police and other authorities and helped keep her safe. No charges were brought against her parents, but she's now left home. Some people Miriam's group help end up becoming volunteers themselves. Like Rehana. She grew up in a strictly religious family in Bangladesh. I was told that it is the Allah's command for parents to tame their children. And my mom said that wherever I beat you on your body, that part, that part goes to the heaven. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so I used to have very negative self-image about myself because I just didn't feel I belonged to my community, my own family, and that used to eat me every day. And I, it was very lonely, very isolated. I mean, I wish... My parents accepted me the way I am, and if they supported me, I mean, that would be enough. If they're angry with me, I, I, I would wish that they forgive me, I mean, and accept me the way I am. I've done everything, but I wasn't good enough. <laughs> Rehana has now come out publicly as an ex-Muslim. Bring it close to your mouth. Hold, here, I'll hold it for you. Yes. Our new movement! of this defending free speech starts now, starts from here. But she says it has devastated her relationship with her family. I haven't seen my family for a year now. I, I can't go back to my country. I lost my friend. I just want to believe that maybe one day I can go back to my family and, and embrace them and tell them I love them. I just, I, I just can't replace how much uh, the, feel I, the pain I feel. I, I don't think, no matter how much I work uh, as an actor or anything, I can never, you know, I can just never, you know, replace that. I'm, I can't do that. I love them. But I just, I, I can never tell them how much I love them. <laughs> They're so concerned about their parents. I mean, Rehana's father is cursing her on, on, on the internet, and she hears about an attack in Bangladesh, and she's worried about them. All they want to do is just think a different way, and they're not allowed to. But Dr. Alhamdoun argues it's not realistic to expect atheists to be treated the same way by a religious community. That's normal perspective. In the eyes of the religion, you have done something wrong because religion expects you to stay religious. And you're saying, I don't want to be religious. So they, of course, can say to you, you're no longer favorable in our eyes. 
It doesn't mean that we discriminate against you. It doesn't mean that we treat you badly or you know, incite hatred or violence or whatever, or, or abduct you or mar force married you or whatever. But, but at the same people time, do they do that and that's wrong. We have to reject that. So how we treat people is the same. We don't discriminate, but our love, our interest cannot be the same. It's just, it's, just, it's just human behavior. Islam is a, is a pragmatic religion. It doesn't expect people to behave outside the human, their human norms. Dr. El Hamdoun is a mainstream Muslim figure who condemns incitement or discrimination. But you don't have to spend too long online to find a huge amount of Islamic preaching which follows a fundamentalist interpretation of Islam and is directed against apostates. Major satellite and online channels broadcast globally, including into the UK. This is Dr. Zakir Naik from India, one of the most popular TV preachers in the world. But if the person who reverts, who was a Muslim, then converts to and becomes a non-Muslim and propagates his faith and speaks against Islam, and if it's an Islamic rule, then the person should be put to death or Sheikh Asim al-Hakim, who broadcasts in English from Saudi Arabia and visits the UK to preach. In Islam, the punishment for apostasy is death penalty only after a panel of judges interrogate, speak to that person, try to bring him back to his senses. If he still insists, then this is worse than a, a, a grand treason, and Allah Azzawajal knows best. Or Haytham al-Haddad, a British imam and Islamic broadcaster. The hellfire is waiting for anyone who is rejecting Allah and his messenger. Moreover, their families, they should not continue having any kind of relationship with them. All of these videos are easily accessed in the UK. Ex-Muslims say these kind of speeches could encourage the community to discriminate against them. Apostates are supposed to be killed. So parents then feel that they have a duty to reject their children. The religion essentially provides them with the, the rules, doesn't it? If this person starts leaving a religion and stepping outside of the bounds of the faith, then you have to punish them. But Dr. Hamdoun thinks this kind of preaching doesn't have much of an effect on families. Yes, these spiritual leaders do have influence, but end of the day, what really matters for the families is their own dynamics. Not because the Imam has said it, not because the community has said it, it's because they feel betrayed. He says he disagrees with the idea that ex-Muslims should be treated equally in every way by the community. In your line of thinking, and this is the idealistic way, is that you should treat people uh, the same in every aspect, but society doesn't. It's not pragmatic. Your outlook on life is not pragmatic. They're going to be treated less because they're no longer view. If they're looked at from the religious lens, they've dropped in the religious lens, in the religious uh, hierarchy, in the religious numeration. I've been filming with the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, a group who help people who have left Islam. Many of the young people I interviewed said they felt themselves to be hated within Muslim communities. Some were self-harming, even suicidal. A lot of them felt scared too and wanted me to hide their identity. I wanted to know why they felt so frightened. Many said they'd been terrified by a series of attacks internationally on ex-Muslims and people who had spoken out against religious fundamentalism. I flew to America to meet a woman who has faced the full horror of religious extremism. Borna Ahmed is a Bangladeshi author and activist. She lived in this house in Atlanta with her husband for 13 years. So we have like all the books, on, those are biological sciences. That's Avijit's God books. Avijit Roy was a scientist and an online atheist campaigner. He actively spoke out against growing religious fundamentalism in his country. 
these are the 10 books he wrote. Okay, so this is about physics, history of physics, kind of. This is about origin of life. This is the virus of faith. That was the book they say killed him. Last year, Avijit was brutally murdered in the streets of Bangladesh after the couple went to visit a book fair. Now Bonna has decided to leave the home they shared together. You know, as I am actually taking those books out, sorting them, there's, there's so much memory in them. I'm, I'm, I, haven't, I haven't started even sorting packing yet because I'm scared. It's going to remind me all the memories, I guess. It was almost like 8 o'clock, and we decided, Avijit actually told me that he hasn't seen the other side of the, there, there was something going on on the other side of the road, which was for the children's book fair. So he wanted to see that side. We walked over there, it was already dark, and it happened in the middle of the street. We were surrounded by thousands of people. And that's all I remember. I do not have any memory of that attack. The other attacks I have seen before and after, they do attack with machetes. Um, it's a meat cleaver, um, and uh, I guess uh, they think that's the proper religious way to kill you. The next thing I remember is I'm in a, some kind of vehicle. There's something very heavy on my lap, and I'm all soaked in blood, and I'm asking someone, if they're, where are you taking me? Are you going to kill me? I have four head stabs, um, like machete ones on my head. Those are like six, seven inches. Uh, one didn't even heal properly on my neck. And I kept asking, I said, please tell me what happened to Avijit. Please tell me what happened to him and I can take it. Trust me, I can take it. Avijit died in hospital of massive blood loss. You know, it, it takes a lot of effort to, to build a relationship like that based on, based on love, based on philosophical basis, based on intellectual basis, based on the respect, equality. I think what I had was precious. It didn't have to end so soon. Over the past three years, dozens of people have been attacked in Bangladesh by Islamist gangs wielding machetes. Many of the victims were people who had left Islam or who had criticized the growing influence of religion in their country. Some had written blogs which infuriated Islamic fundamentalists. Maryam Namazi knew Avijit and campaigned alongside him. Given the pressures and the intimidations that are involved. She says these killings were the result of years of extremist propaganda throughout the Muslim world. They've made the term and being atheist so derogatory that you just have to label someone a mortad or a kafir, and it's enough to incite mob violence against them. That's what's happened with the Bangladeshi bloggers. A lot of them wrote about science, they wrote about human rights issues. Yeah, possibly some were critical of Islam. What linked them all together was the fact that, you know, let's call them atheist and that will be sufficient to incite mass murder against them, you know, in broad daylight. I met Arif Rahman. He's living in hiding in London because he's a prominent Bangladeshi atheist blogger and he's been targeted by the same death squads. He admits he sometimes wrote provocative and even insulting comments about Islam. 
but he sees the bloggers as a resistance movement against religious extremism. We were the one who uh, fought back in the front line. And we created this space with, behind us where it was less turbulent. And our objective was to push it outward and more and more thinkers and, you know, people who should not be worried about their life can constantly do their thing. When we started writing, um, as I said, back in 2006, we did not think that people would be killed over this. And in 2013, our first um, colleague, uh, Ahmed Rajiv Haidar, he was an architect. Um, he was hacked to death in front of his house. That was the first time we could realize that this is, re this is real. This could potentially happen. Rajib Heather was a satirist whose blog often made jokes about Islamic beliefs. He'd also taken part in protests calling for the execution of convicted Islamist war criminals. A human being has been murdered. That should have been the end of it. Doesn't matter what he wrote, doesn't matter what he said. But that became a thing. In the days immediately after his death, tens of thousands of people marched in the streets of Bangladesh calling for the hanging of atheist bloggers. Islamist negative propaganda was on full swing at that moment. It was vicious religious rhetoric, and it was also political. Islamists were using the term atheist to attack the secular government and the protesters. The whole propaganda started in Bangladesh. The same thing started here as well, in London. It didn't take long to find out what he was talking about. This is a video on YouTube of one of the protests which took place in London. It was held only a few days after the murder of the blogger Rajib Heather. They are condemning him and insulting him. These aren't fringe extremist speakers talking in this way about a murdered writer. They're important community leaders. This is Mufti Shah Sadruddin. He's one of the most senior religious figures in the Bangladeshi British community. He's the rector of a full-time secondary school and a leading figure in this organization known as the jamaat -e ulama UK, the Council of Muslim Scholars in the UK, based in London. No room for any atheists he even ran for election as a conservative councillor, portraying himself as liberal, tolerant and opposed to hatred. I believe in equality. I believe in fairness. I believe in loving the human race. And I hate to hate anybody. Here he is a year earlier, speaking about atheists who he said had insulted Islam. In this case, a Bangladeshi blogger. He's calling for the death penalty to be introduced in Bangladesh for people who insult Islam.
He says their fight will be non-violent and political. A number of these rallies were held around the UK in 2013, all organized by senior community leaders. This is Junaid Ahmed, another imam with the Jamaat Ulama UK. Arif Rahman says that in 2013, he heard that his name was being passed around outside the mosques in London. Somebody told me and somebody then forwarded me as a bunch of leaflets. That leaflet had my name, my photo and screenshot, translated English screenshot of what I wrote. And they were printing them in multicolor and they were handing them out outside of um, mosques. In London? In London. And I heard that certain shady characters were looking for me, saying, who is this Arif Rahman? Do you know anybody? Do you know anybody? He says he had to move house and step up his security measures. He's still living in hiding now. This is how Islamists implant fear, by being borderline legal. I found this leaflet online. It looks similar to the ones he's talking about. It names three bloggers, including Arif and accuses them of blasphemous writings. It was posted on Facebook by this man, Sayyid Naim Ahmed. He is the organizing secretary of the jamaat e ulama UK. He's a charity trustee and also a broadcaster on Islamic TV. He circulated the leaflet on his Facebook feed just over a week after the murder of Rajib, as well as a number of images calling for atheist bloggers to be hanged. I wanted to know what kind of impact rhetoric like this has on young atheists growing up inside the community. I showed the videos to Rehana, an ex-Muslim from Bangladesh who now lives in the UK. This kind of um, lectures creates an environment that actually that, that subconsciously teaches devout Muslims to see ex-Muslims or anyone who thinks out of the box as a threat, further ostracizing them. De dehumanizing them, bullying them. So it further creates so much dangers for people to come out as an ex-Muslim. So it, it really like, you know, kind of pushes ex-Muslims back into the closet even further when this kind of things, videos are being put on YouTube. I wrote to the speakers in these videos and I wanted to hear from them. I've been filming with the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, a volunteer group who help atheists from around the Islamic world. In 12 countries, all of them Muslim, apostasy or blasphemy carries the death penalty. The Council is in contact with thousands of people who live in these countries, and sometimes they try to help them if they need to escape. It's four o'clock in the morning in central London. I'm meeting Imad Habib, a long-time member of the council. Where are you going? So I'm going to a hotel where there is um, two uh, girls who contacted us, who uh, want to escape. The young women have contacted his group after seeing their campaigns online. We've been in church for probably a long time, maybe a few months. We're gonna meet them. I will try to get them somewhere safe. The women come from an extremely strict Islamic country. Their family is on holiday in London no, and they've decided to run away. Imad himself made the same journey. After he came out publicly as an ex-Muslim, he had to leave Morocco to escape prosecution by the authorities and attacks by religious extremists. First of all, you know, you suffer, you suffer, you suffer. There is no one to help you. If you speak out at any moment, you're going to be at risk. You feel afraid, you feel scared that 
anybody might find out who you are really. It's, 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 a, it's a really risky journey that those people take. But that's all we can show. Imad and I did meet the young people, but they said they were too scared to be in the film at all. We can't say any more for their own safety. We can't even say what country they come from. But it was a small insight into a much larger, much broader phenomenon. I came to realize that Maryam Namazi and her group are plugged into a growing international resistance movement. I wanted to hear from some of them. So maybe we can start with um, uh, Nadia Elfani uh, from Tunisia. Nadia is a filmmaker and made this documentary in 2011. It looked at growing Islamic fundamentalism in her native Tunisia. When she tried to show this film at a cinema in Tunis, a mob gathered and violently shut down the screening. Nobody saw the movie, you know, because they destroy a cinema and uh, to don't let the people see the movie. Then the authorities brought charges against her. Until now, you know, I have six uh, uh, charges in justice uh, against me for blasphemy and insult. I'm like a terrorist for them, you know. Undeterred, Nadia is making another film to continue to challenge the power of Islamist fundamentalism in her region. They have to ask themselves why they are afraid about freedom, you know. They are afraid about freedom because they know if the people think, you know, by their own, they will not get the power anymore. This woman is an atheist blogger living in hiding in Bangladesh where a number of atheist bloggers have been butchered in the street by Islamist gangs. Despite the extreme danger, she carries on. This website was set up in 2011 for atheists in Pakistan. But its founder, Fozia Ilyas, faced multiple death threats and was charged with blasphemy. Revealing yourself as an atheist in Pakistan is like having a death penalty or death wish. You are as good as dead. Nearly 40 people are currently on death row or serving life sentences for blasphemy in Pakistan, although no one has been executed to date. Often the charge itself is enough to result in mob violence against the accused. Imagine, just imagine living with the constant fear that an angry mob will torture you to death if they found out you are an apostate. Last year, Fozia was forced to flee Pakistan and claim asylum in the West. I lost my daughter, now she's an eight years old. And I didn't see her from last four years because court just give custody to my ex-husband. This is life and this is Pakistan with your atheism. A few months ago, one of their international network was brutally murdered. He was 17-year-old Omar Mohammed Batawil from Yemen. Osama al-Binni is head of the Arab Atheist Network, which Omar was part of. He says Omar was abducted and murdered because of posts he made on Facebook, which criticized fundamentalist preachers. So, uh, let, let me give you an example of, of one of the things that uh, this wonderful young man said. They accuse me of atheism. Oh, you people, I see God in the flowers and you see him in the graveyards. That is the difference between you and me. He was unfortunately killed for freedom of speech, for the right to speak out. He says their numbers are growing. You cannot stop the deluge. They, they cannot stop what has started. We are not going to be silenced anymore. One report estimated that there are 1.5 million atheists in Saudi Arabia and another 4 million in Pakistan. The internet and social media is doing to Islam what the printing press did to Christianity because it's one way in which 
masses of people can connect with each other, can hear ideas that are taboo and forbidden. These are all members of the international ex-Muslim network. Their identities are hidden and their voices have been disguised because of the severe risks they face. We are existing everywhere in the Muslim country. This is my passport, I am a Saudi atheist. We have everything to lose. Despite you trying to suppress our voices, we're not afraid. I want me to live in a country where I can say everything in public without people trying to kill me. We will use our pen, our computer and internet in our resistance against extremist people. Just because we're silent doesn't mean we don't exist and people need to remember that. I found that even in Britain, ex-Muslims can struggle to be heard. Islamic activists often try to prevent Maryam speaking at events. Last year, she went to Goldsmith University and faced disruption. Of course, there's a distinction between Islam as a belief versus Islamism, which is a far-right political movement. It's Stop telling people like myself... The activists tried to disrupt the talk because they said Maryam is an Islamophobe and her views created a climate of hatred toward Muslim students. Don't touch me! No, don't touch me! No, you touch me! They also said some images she displayed insulted Islam. Plus, isn't it racist to imply that all Muslims cannot tolerate criticism and free thought? Why can't you guys let her speak? You've had your time to think. The point is that you... Don't decide that I have a right to live. ISIS does, the Iraqi Christian does. Are you an Islamophobe? I don't like Islam. I don't like religion, you know, and I think that lots of free thinkers don't like religion. They any, don't... Any religion? Any religion. We need to be able to criticize beliefs without any conditions. We have to. And that's how the world changes because of this constant discussion and debate and criticism of beliefs, whilst holding human beings, in my opinion, sacred. I'd written to these British Bangladeshi religious leaders to ask them about their statements on atheists. Mufti Shah Sadruddin said his speeches did not incite hatred and there was no intention to promote violence. The others did not respond. Mufti Shah Sadruddin had stood for election as a local councillor. I contacted the Conservative Party, but they did not respond. During my time filming, I found many ex-Muslims were estranged from their communities. But I saw how some found a new sense of belonging, even a new family with Maryam. Like Rehana, I saw her give her first speech as an open ex-Muslim. After coming to the UK, I met the ex-Muslim community. And it was a transforming moment for me because I didn't know that there is a big world where I would meet ex-Muslims from across cultures, across race, and they would become a family. And at one of their meetings, I saw her devise a social media campaign. Can we have a hashtag running like yes. ex-Muslim because I think now is the most important time to raise an awareness. Because people don't understand the difference between being an ex-Muslim and being anti-Muslim. Yeah. So on the 19th of November, we, we first published that we're having this campaign on Twitter called hashtag ExMuslim Because. And you can um, send your tweets and pictures. So that happened around 12 in the morning. And we thought it's going to be a big flop. We would get a lot of hatred and then, you know, it's not going to be very popular. And then at 4 uh, in the morning, I checked my phone and I saw it was trending on number one on Twitter. And it went on fire. In the next two days, it spread to 72 countries. And we had then, so far, 118,000 tweets. Growing up in Bangladesh, Rehana said she had been terrified to come out as an ex-Muslim because of the threat of reprisals. But now, she has overcome her fears. I just didn't want to die. Oh, I don't want to die because I'm an atheist. I am a kafir, but I don't have that fear anymore, maybe because I'm not afraid of death anymore. No good thing in this world has ever happened because people were too scared. So I just don't want to be scared. I want my life and my work to be as big as my fear of death used to be. 
Yes. At the end of filming, I met up with Sadia at the grave of her brother. She had decided to take part in the film to pay tribute to Raza. He had committed suicide. She says it's partly because he felt sidelined and misunderstood by his community all his life. One reason being his atheism. How do you want your brother remembered? I want him remembered as a good friend and someone who is really, really intelligent. It takes a lot of strength of mind to challenge something you've been told your entire life. I wrote to Sadia's parents to ask them if they wished to talk to me about Raza and his story, but they declined. Sadia has stayed in contact with her parents. She doesn't blame them for Raza's depression. She blames a culture and a community which stigmatizes ex-Muslims and drives families apart. What do you want the parents of, of ex-Muslims to know? To support their children. To not isolate them. Um, to not abandon them. Surely the life of your children is more important than a book or a faith. To not kind of wait until the point where their children have ended their lives to rethink everything. Because there's no bigger tragedy than a parent mourning their child's death.